Hello and welcome to our Give Love Bradford podcast, where we'll be delving into conversations being held across the district and learning more about how we can come together to create positive change for the communities that need it the most. Give Bradford supports hundreds of charities and voluntary groups across Bradford addressing inequalities. We invest in these groups by distributing grants and sharing advice, acting as a catalyst for positive change. Today's host is Steph Taylor, Director at Give Bradford. Hello, my name is Steph Taylor from Give Bradford. Welcome to our second episode of the Give Love Bradford podcast. In today's episode, we'll be joined by Mary Dowson from Bradford Community Broadcasting and Naz Kazmi from Keithley Association for Women and Children's Centre. But first, we'll be talking to Luke Walstenholme, son of Manjit Walstenholme, who was a really significant person in our district. Her life story was one of building the skills and perseverance to break down barriers to succeed in business. Manjit Walsenholm was born in India and went to school in Wolverhampton. Manjit became the youngest woman to head an investment bank in London and went on to become the first woman from an ethnic minority background to chair and lead a FTSE 100 company, Provident Financial, based here in Bradford. With support from Provident Financial Group, Manjit's family established the Manjit Walsenholm Fund, which so far has distributed nearly £80,000 to nine groups and is a fantastic example of what philanthropy can achieve in the district. The fund was launched on a Manjit with the aim of supporting children and young people in disadvantaged areas of Bradford to achieve their potential by providing educational and aspirational opportunities. Manjit's own experiences meant she believed passionately that no one should be denied the chance to achieve their true potential as a result of their backgrounds or where they live. We caught up with Sharon Orr, Community Affairs Manager at Provident Financial Group, who shared why this fund is so important to them. We wanted to work closely with Manjit's family to make sure the fund reflected her remarkable, inspiring journey and to support the projects we knew she would have been passionate about. And it's been brilliant working with Neil, Luke and Lily because they knew Manjit best of all. And it made absolute sense to work with the team at Give Bradford because they know which organisations are supporting our communities most effectively. And this expertise gives us peace of mind that the funding will make a difference. The grants panels have enabled us to involve provident colleagues, many of whom live in the Bradford district and are often volunteers in our communities. So they also have a real sense of what's going on. And I think we're all really looking forward to learning more about the fund's impact. And it's going to be great to hear today from some of the grant recipients. We know how tough the pandemic's been for our communities. So we've been happy to have been able to play our part in supporting them alongside the Wollstone Home family. And here's Luke. Hi, Luke. How are you doing today? I'm very good, Steph. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here um, doing this podcast with you. Thank you so much for, for inviting me on to do this. No, thank you. Um, you're going to be co-hosting with me today. Um, but before we get grilling our two brilliant guests, uh, can you tell us a little bit about why it's so important to you and your family to have a fund that promotes educational and aspirational opportunities in Bradford? Yeah, so I mean, the fund idea um, was obviously born out of my my mother's sudden passing um, a few years ago, which was, you know, obviously a tragedy for myself and my family. Um, and you you have to try and use that tragedy to to make something positive you know you can either wallow um or, or as i say have a positive impact and um you know the projects that we try to fund um i suppose emulate in, in many ways sort of the the upbringing that my my mother had as a kid she was from wolverhampton and you know there, there weren't many opportunities i suppose for for herself when she was growing up so you know a lot of the projects uh, that we funded i know we're going to be speaking to later on today you know aim to try and tackle that issue and so that's why it matters so much to us it's, it's in her name um and trying to yeah have people dream big like she did uh, when she was young so yeah it's uh, it's a it's a beautiful thing to be a part of fantastic thanks luke that's that's really moving and um as you say we're going to meet some of the organizations that have got funding um through the manjit wilson home fund just tell us a little bit more, if you will, about the the impact the funds had on your family being part of Give Bradford. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 been quite emotional, I suppose, to uh, you know to be involved um, quite heavily with it. We have these excellent panels uh, once a year, and and just being able to be aware of the great work that's being done um, in Bradford is 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 it's, it's amazing, really. I think the sort of the, you know the grassroots charities where they really 
um, they, they help people. They really change people's lives because they work in such small communities. It's so important. And I think it is overlooked sometimes, you know, I feel like that's what, yeah, as I said, that's where real change happens. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been emotional at times, as I say, to, um, to be a part of it, but it's, it's meant so much to me and my family. I know it's been part of the healing process on a personal level, just, you know, feel like you can help one person, um, then that would be a, you know, a success uh, and hopefully, you know, that, that will happen. Um, but we just hope there's some longevity in it. I think we, we didn't want it to be a, a one-time thing, you know, a, a one-off. Um, so it's been really nice this year to be able to continue that. And, um, you know, we want to be able to continue it for a long time, um, as I say, and, and help as many people as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that will have huge value in the district. I can really empathize with what you're saying about the smaller grassroots groups. And one of the things I love about Give Bradford is that we're able to fund and support those groups and often those unsung heroes in communities that are that are really doing work that changes lives and wouldn't otherwise get profile or get funding for it. So um, should we meet a couple of those organisations now? I think that sounds great. Fantastic. So um, first of all, we're going to speak to Mary Dowson from Bradford Community Broadcasting. Bradford Community Broadcasting is a community organisation that uses engagement with community radio to bring about social change. BCB 106.6 FM is the community radio station for Bradford, made by and for its diverse communities. And definitely worth a listen um, if you don't already to know what's going on across the district. It's a, it's a great listen. Um, and there's a small staff team there that provide training and support for over 200 volunteers, enabling them to gain the skills and confidence needed to become broadcasters and participants. Welcome, Mary. Thank you so much for joining us. No, it's lovely to be here with you. Um, and I'll introduce you to Luke, who's my co-host for today. It's lovely to meet you, Mary. Hi, Luke. So um, do you want to kick off with your questions, Luke? Yeah, that'd be great. I think first up, it, I'd love to know a little bit more about uh, your project and the impact that sort of has uh, on the community. Yeah, I mean, particularly focusing on, on young people and the work we do with young people. We've always seen the importance of engaging young people in community radio. One of the things that we... We used to see ourselves as a community radio station and, and much, it will describe ourselves in that way. But now we've actually, over the last few years, we've really realised that we're a community organisation that uses radio as a tool for that engagement and for social change. And, and in many ways, it could be something else that we could use. But, but we actually, we choose to use radio as a way to to engage people and it's and it's a great way to to work with with young people because it you know radio at the focus is something quite exciting and creative and interesting and who doesn't want to be a dj <laughs> so so it's a really good way of, of engaging young people but actually through that engagement then there's so much we can work with and support young people for especially those who are from more marginalised communities or disadvantaged communities. And, and so we do see that engagement with radio very much as a as the kind of the hook to get people involved with a community organisation, involved with, with other people. And um, yeah, and so, so that's kind of been, I say, how we, how we use radio. And, and it's been a really successful way to engaging with young people. And, and so we're, you know, really pleased that we're able to, to carry on through the Magic Wilson Home Fund, able to carry on with that work um, with the young people that we're, we're already engaged with. And yeah, I, I think, you know, the power of, of the media is so important. I mean, I myself, uh, you know, hopefully going into broadcast journalism, you know, I think it's fantastic. You touched on creativity, especially. I think it's, it's perfect for that. Um, but do you think, you know, Bradford Community Broadcasting is aiming to sort of inspire those those marginalised voices, which I know you, you touched on briefly as well. Is that is that a real aim of the project? Completely. Uh, I think I think for most of us, we are perhaps a little bit not perhaps in the last few years it's changed a little bit, but most of us are passive consumers of media. It comes at us and we listen to it. We sometimes shout at the telly or at the radio. But actually turning people into active broadcasters, and especially young people, is absolutely vital. I mean, we, we all know about critical thinking these days. We know how important it is for young people to be able to discern between what's misinformation, disinformation, fake news, where information comes from. 
there's no better way of actually understanding how the media works than actually making a radio program or producing media yourself. You understand about, oh, this is how it happens. This is how, oh, this is how things could be edited. Or this is who I chosen to bring into this, to tell this story. So actually that really powerful way of actually helping young people to understand media and, you know, media literacy or critical thinking is really, really, really important. And I think it's never been more important than it is now. So if we can do that through young people actually making their own programmes, and that's vital. The other thing about is aspirations. You know, for so many young people, they've never, never considered that they could be the ones telling the stories. They could be the ones making those radio and television programmes. And so suddenly actually thinking, I could do this, you know, I didn't know this job existed. People get paid for doing this. People do this for a living. So, so, and, and there have been, and there was one particular young, young woman, and I won't mention her name, who came to us on, on work experience. She was an absolute music freak, loved music. Really her mum's music more than her own that she'd inherited. But she loved music, massive, massive uh, passion for music. So she came on work experience. She carried on, as many do with the common work experience, carrying on making radio with us and carried on doing a programme. She then decided she wanted to go into radio. So she applied to university, do a radio production course. And last year she, she graduated and with a bit of encouragement from us, approached Radio 5. We had a good connection at 5 Live. And just sent her, anyway, she's now got a full-time job as a producer at 21, I think she's 22 now, as a radio producer at 5 Live, which is amazing. When I'm awake in the middle of the night and I'm listening to Radio 5 Live, and I hear Jocelyn Azariah mention her name, I think, go girl. <laughs> so, you know, so that's just an example of how that engagement, that opportunity can actually change, really change the course of someone's life. I mean, I think that's just so beautiful to hear, honestly. And, and you know, you can, you can see me smiling. I know uh, people can only hear this through audio, but I have a beaming smile because it's so great to hear stories like that of people having the opportunity and, and taking the opportunity um, as well. And I guess just on that point, um, you know, regarding, again, you, you know, your project, what are the challenges, I suppose, that the, the young people face when they're having these opportunities? You know, again, focusing on those marginalised maybe voices, it's, it's very hard to get into the media. So is, is, is your project aiming to be sort of the stepping stone to get people to go in? Would you say that that's part of um, what you do? I think it's a small part of what we do, because for most people, it won't be what they want to do. I think what we want to do is open up the horizons and make, you know, make those, those dream, you know, people's got a dream, how can we help them to achieve that? But for many young people that it's, I think it's much more around confidence, building up that confidence, us being able to tell your story, but to articulate what you, be able to put into words what it is you're feeling and your lived experience and actually be listened to. I think we often talk about giving a voice and that, or, you know, and I think actually it's about being listened to. So the fact that if somebody's got a own radio program or they're contributing to a radio program, then it's actually legitimising what they've got to say. It's actually saying what you've got to say, other people want to hear. You've got a right for your voice to be heard and to express yourself in that way and, and be listened to. So I think the aspiration of actually a media career is one which we would always want to kind of open up and support young people to think about. But I think it's much, much more about that self-esteem, valuing yourself, making the space for, for people to say to have a voice and be listened to, and being able to express yourself with a confidence and, and a belief in yourself, which we know that for lots of middle-class kids, they get those opportunities. They get that they are listened to. They are, people are asking their opinions, you know, like, for many, many young people that we work with, nobody ever asks them their opinions. Nobody asks them to, to put into words what they're feeling or what they're, or to even the fact that they've got an opinion about something. So, so actually making that space for that to be happened, for that to happen, I think is absolutely vital. And especially for those, those say more and more marginalised or disadvantaged young people that we, that we want to work with. Yeah, I think that's so beautifully put again, Mary. I mean, the confidence thing is is so 
key. I completely agree. I mean, I'm quite a young uh, person. I'm 24, but I know when I was when I was slightly younger, I struggled with confidence as well. And I think public speaking, especially, is is something that I'm sure you you never really become fully confident with. But it's something that you can build. It's such an important skill in life. Um, you know, believing I have something important to say, and you uh, should listen to this. Yeah, and I think that that's such an underrated skill as well, having confidence um, in what you're doing. Yeah, I guess like just, you know, the story you told before of, um, you know, someone going to Five Live and being a producer is so great. I was wondering if, you know, you would be able to sort of share um, any other stories uh, from some of the young people um, involved with the project um, and, you know, sort of the, the support they've had through it. Yeah, I was just thinking about sort of particularly young people. We're we work with particularly with, with a school in, in Ollerton, and that's a school which is really at the heart of a, a disadvantaged community. And it is so committed to not just the school being a school, but the school working with the community. And so we've been uh, working with them and, and, and again through lockdown as well, because the schools you know, had a lot of children still in schools so and schools been open all the way through as many have and keeping the, the, the children have been doing, producing like regular reports, you know, from Academy St. James. And that's been absolutely lovely that they've been documenting and producing those reports that we've been broadcasting on BCB. And again, it's that, that thing about them, them being able to, to tell the story of what they're doing from, the, from their own perspective. So that's been really, really good. I think the other thing that's been really important over this sort of this period, this 12 month period that we've all been in, is how much the young people, especially sort of people in early teens, you know, need somewhere to be. And whether that's a virtual space or a physical space, we've not been able to have those physical spaces very often, but the virtual space where they can come together and just be somewhere with an adult in the room, you know, for, for an hour or two a week has been really, really important. And I, think, I was just thinking about one young woman who does a programme. She's really into musicals and she's a looked after young, young woman and, and she's really into musicals. So she's actually been able to produce radio programmes about musicals. Sort of thing. But during February, when it was LGBTQ History Month and we did a lot of focus broadcasting around that, she produced her half hour programme, not about musical, but about sexuality and gender and gender diversity. And it was so powerful that she had that confidence to produce this programme for other young people around, I say, gender diversity. And again, I, I'd listened to it and I was just so proud of what she'd done and the fact that she'd come to that point of being able to do that. And that, that was really, really special for me. That was really, really inspiring, Mary. I was just thinking about the power of storytelling and how we use storytelling to communicate both our own personal journeys, but also what's needed across the district for people and communities. And um, yeah, there's a lot in that, that it would be, it would be really nice to think about how we, we share more broadly as well. At Give Bradford, obviously, we're, we're kind of here to make sure that we broker investment into communities so you can do more of what it is you're doing really brilliantly with young people. What kind of investment would you want to see coming into communities to support particularly children and young people that are in areas of deprivation and, and perhaps are those marginalised, have those marginalised voices? I think the most important thing is ongoing. I think short term funding is really hard, really, really hard to to work with. And so as, as lovely as it is to get a year's funding, to be honest, it, it, it doesn't help us to be there for when young people need us, you know, and when does a young person stop becoming a young person? When do you become a young adult? You know, I think for some young people, they've actually, they're with us for years and years through them from early teens through to that transition from leaving school into the next bit of their life. And when you've built up a, a safe, secure relationship, especially if you don't have lots of other ones of those relationships in your life, then having that organisation, those people, the place where you can be your whole self, you know, is so important. And so I think what I would urge is sort of a longer term commitment to organisations and a trust that this organisation does good work <laughs> and they are embedded in the lives of young people or, or communities 
and a trust that actually we don't want you to do, you know, tell us what this amazing, you know, unique new project innovation you're going to do is, but how can you stay and be there for when young people need you? So I think my, my biggest sort of ask would be a longer term commitment to, to funding. Yeah. Thank you. And um, that's echoed by many of the community organisations that we speak to. And um, it's definitely something that I think with good, strong partnerships, um, we can we can achieve through our grant making. I'm kind of struck by what you were saying about innovation as well. I think that traditionally the foundation sector especially has been obsessed with innovation and the idea that <laughs> some, something new and something shiny and something that, you know, we can be a part of saying that we helped you achieve is, is, you know, the kind of often the way that philanthropy happens. And, um, you know, we've seen a lot of shifts through the pandemic, I think, actually, in some ways, there's been opportunities to demonstrate what happens in communities is, is solid and it works. And, you know, why reinvent the wheel, just <laughs> fund what's there and what we know is working. So very much behind you on that one, Mary, and trying to do what we can to support community organisations in that way. Mary Dalton, Bradford Community Broadcasting, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. It's been, been lovely to have the opportunity to reflect on what we do and to be able to express some of the, yeah, some of the achievements that we've been able to do with the funding that we've received and an opportunity to, to say thank you to. Next, we're going to meet Naz Kazmi from Keithley Association for Women and Children's Centre, which is a small needs driven organisation advocating with and for vulnerable and disadvantaged women. Founded in 1984, they work in Keithley and operate from a women and girls centre off Lawcombe Lane. Women come from the town's urban core. Many are of South Asian, Pakistani and Bangladeshi background. But this is now diversifying with the influx of Eastern, Central European and African migrants as well. The organisation is run by women for women. And like so many of our community organisations, has a very active volunteer team. Hi, Naz. Really nice to see you. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Nice to be here today. How are you doing, Naz? It's an absolute pleasure uh, to meet you. Oh, thank you. I know Luke's got some questions for you, Naz, about the project that we funded through the Manjit Wilson Home Fund. Quite lovely, yes. Well, to, to start with, Naz, I'd just love to know more about your project um, and, and what you're trying to target, um, most of all. Right, first of all, uh, the project was aimed at young, young Bain girls, Asian girls, who didn't have any clarity about career progressions and who weren't given the, the, the right information or being able to get the right guidance and advice to be able to get into a, a career of their choice. You've got to remember that there's lots and lots of other problems within these young girls' lives growing up with a very traditional and cultural background. So I'm not going to put faith in there just yet because it's more tradition and culture and, and thinking of their families. So the families weren't giving them the proper guidance because of their stagnated views of giving independence to their young women to be able to be financially independent because it's about control again, isn't it? To give them that freedom, to, freedom of choice. And the other side, the, the, the flip side was that because of the career support that young people are supposed to have in schools, and also have um, the proper guidance to understand the cultural aspects of a child's life. Because sometimes when you go into areas where um, you are given the, 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 the guidance and the advice, but there's that the traditional and the cultural context isn't there because you have to be from that kind of a, a background to be able to understand what the stagnated views are of parents and families to allow their daughters to be able to progress into something. Now, you, you might ask me this question, Luke, is that what world do you live in, Naz? And I'm going to say, well, I live in Keithley, but we really haven't moved on as we should have done with the times and, you know, the advancement of our systems, advancement of our education and adv advancement of our thinking, really. And we need to be moving in that direction where, um, there's still those stagnated views of families and um, other people around in the community. Yeah, I, I think that's so admirable to be tackling that and giving people sort of the belief 
to um, yeah to progress to believe in in progressing forward. But I know from obviously reading about your organisation, there's a particular focus on on STEM, and I was wondering if you could sort of illuminate why that's so important to get people into to STEM subjects. Right. The the STEM focus was that um, we had some young girls approaching us, and this is through some consultation that we had with the young people, and it was about what they saw STEM as just these guys walking around, men, predominantly men, wearing these high visible vests with their little caps on and just working on a building site. So that was the perspective they had because it's a very stereotypical view of being in an engineering world. They didn't look deeper into what engineering consists of. You know, we had science, technology, maths, uh, engineering. It was about taking those layers off, those subjects, and to be able to have them uh, something sort of more in-depth knowledge, skills and experience of what does it need to get to a place, but not, I mean, high visible vests are fantastic. Yeah, but there is other elements to becoming, you know, an engineer. So it could be something to do with, tech, you know, technical, it could be IT, it could be other, other, other things. Uh, and also to be able to give them that, environment as well to, to allow them to go into higher education places like the universities and they get to speak to the teachers directly, they get to speak to the champions of the universities who are doing the STEM subjects, talking to role models, which this project allowed us to do because they took them into some of the labs, the engineering labs in University of Bradford. This was before lockdown, by the way. And then um, they did a lot of virtual tours as well. They you know, they managed to talk to the teachers, some of the role models there, some of the uh, young girls have graduated in engineering. So they, so this project allowed us to open that space for them, to allow them to be able to have those in-depth conversations, to gain more knowledge, because if you're not knowledgeable, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to decide if you're not given the right guidance and the right pathways to get to where, where you need to be. And can I just say, out of this, we also opened doors to other career opportunities as well. So we looked into the police because there's underrepresentation of them, uh, women in the police. There's also a, an underrepresentation of girls, young girls, Asian girls going into engineering. And that was my focus, was to open them doors, those career opportunities, apprenticeships, and, and to be able to allow them to have that, those discussions with their families. Because if you look at, look at it, you know, when, when a girl goes home and says, oh, dad, I want to be an engineer. Dad has no knowledge. Mum has no knowledge what an engineer, you know, what does it constitute to be an engineer? What do you need? Oh, no, 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 no. Be, be, be a teacher. Go and do uh, care work or um, be a teacher because you know what? You're going to be home for your children. You're going to get married. So these are the views of the families and you know yourself, uh, Luke, how that has a massive impact on a young person's life and that decision-making process because right at the end of the tunnel, all they can see is a marriage for young girls. So these are the, the problems, the obstacles, the challenges that, you know, we were able to talk to the parents because we have that connection with the community. As I said, that we bridge the gap wherever it's possible. And we were bridging that. So we were bringing the mothers along with us. And this allowed us to talk to the parents as well as the young girls to be able to make those decisions. Yeah, I, I think that's so beautifully put now, honestly. And I, I think what you're saying you know, really struck a chord. I know my mum used to tell me quite a lot um, about, you know, when she was growing up and she obviously had those aspirations to um, go and do um, whatever she wanted. Um, but sometimes, you know, family um, or, or culture, you know, uh, sort of dictate otherwise and they sort of uh, make you feel like maybe you can't do what you want to do and they want to keep you uh, in certain professions or at home or, or whatever it may be. Uh, so I think it's so important to, to address that as an issue because ultimately you just want people to, to believe in themselves, believe that they can do whatever they want to do yeah. um, rather yeah. than being limited. And, and I guess just, just on that and, and what you've been saying, it'd be great you know, if you could share a couple of highlights um, from the projects, um, if, you, if you had any off the top of your head. Yeah, sure. Um, one highlight was um, the, the young girls came forward, the ones who wanted to talk about it because they wanted to raise awareness. 
for other people and other, other young girls to come forward, which was absolutely an amazing piece of work from Gib Bradford when they came and interviewed. But I think one case study is absolutely an amazing one. And it's one of our young girls. Uh, she goes to a very, um, should I say, a very high profile school, but because of stagnated views of her parents, but when it came to the end, she became very, very frustrated because she wasn't getting the right guidance of where she needs to be because she wanted to do engineering. And by uh, in certain interventions from family said, teaching is okay for you, go for teaching, you know, do this and this. And she said, no, but I want, to, I, want, I want to do engineering. I want to become an engineer. Anyway, so she went to different people, different organizations, but she never sort of managed to find what she wanted or to be able to talk to anybody who could understand where she was coming from. So anyway, she ended up um, on our project. So we recruited her and then we helped her. We gave her that bespoke one-to-one -one support where we went through everything that she needed to do. Then we brought the parents into it. We communicated with the parents. We communicated with her. We helped her with her, to build her CV, built her confidence. We did some confidence workshops with her. We did very, very bespoke interventions to be able to get her to a place where she could think of what she really wanted to do. She came out with one A and two Bs and she was, was not satisfied. So she's, she's taken a blooming year out, even after all this, and she's taken a year out. And do you know what? She's now working part time for me to raise awareness about education, how important it is, talk to young people. She's led a, an environmental project. She's, she's got so much things inside her to, to be able to give to others. So she's now we are now helping her. She's gone back to school. So she wants to now get three A's or an A-star. She's an A-star student, can I say? But do you know what? Stepping back and reflecting has given her an opportunity and has given her that drive to, to go back and do it again. And, um, and how many people she's helped on the way. It's absolutely amazing. And she goes and talks to the, the parents as well. So if parents are saying something and, and she comes from a, a young person's perspective and saying, well, you know, my mum and dad used to say that, but it's not like that auntie or it's not like that by G or it's not like that, but this is where you need to be and this is how it is. So uh, perspective has changed. Stereotypical views have changed. So even taking a gap year out, it's not going to have a massive impact on her career. She, she's allowed to step back, do something else and go back in again, but refreshed and reflected on her learning as well. So that will improve her as a human being, as well as herself and her own confidence. And her confidence, she came in and if she was here, her confidence is up there. So can you imagine that, that huge break that she's had? And what it's done to her is that it's given her that, that platform where she can grow and become who she wants to. So she's going into engineering, by the way. So. That is one, one massive case study that we've got. And um, she spoke to Give Bradford about it and she interviewed, uh, she gave the interview and, and she spoke very sort of in depth of her, her journey to where she is today. Oh, she did, Naz. I know the young woman you mean and um, thank yeah. you for sharing that story. It's yeah. really, yeah, really inspirational. Um, I can't, yeah, I can't think of a better kind of story to encourage people to, mm -hmm. to give and support communities. Um, and what you were saying there about, um, about her work really struck me in terms of how communities play such an important role, don't they, in, in building people up and giving people role models and yeah. providing support in different ways that can supplement and complement what happens in family life. It's really, really important, Naz. I wondered if you'd just tell us a little bit about um, investment. So obviously you've been funded through this programme. You do a huge amount of work with, um, with women and with children and young people what investment would you like to see coming into the district for that sort of work? I think this type of investment for especially grassroots organisations, uh, it's welcomed so much that you've got to understand that as a grassroots organisation, we know the communities better. So we will look at their needs in the community. So it's a, we are a needs driven organisation. I'm just going to sort of come back and reflect on, on, on my own organisation and the organisation that I work for is that it's a needs addressed uh, organisation, which advocate we are ad the advocates for our community, for our women, our 
communities and our young people. Because, do you know, if these investments are taken out, it will not give these young people opportunities to have that direct support. The support that they're not able to get in schools, they're not able to get anywhere else. But there are centres like this that they can come into. And these centres, given that space, allows them to have that, that space to be able to talk, to be able to gain experience skills. And it's exactly back again to the young girl. If I was not in a position to open my door to this young person, to give her that uh, support, to be able to help her develop her confidence, develop her skills, knowledge, experience, and, and coming in as a volunteer and then becoming a paid worker, that is a massive step for a young person. So organisations like ourselves, definitely. And a lot of work needs to be done, again, with the BAME community because there's lots and lots of barriers. Again, emphasis on social mobility, underrepresentation in employment, underrepresentation under on strategic boards, having a voice. You know, these are sort of very challenging areas that there needs to be a lot of investment for young people. And then the next part is now mental health. That is now, it's a priority. Because you've got to remember that these young people have been in a, an environment, a home environment. So they've really had just virtual connection with people, but nothing physical. Because as we are human beings, we need physical connections. We need to be able to touch. We need to be able to speak. We need to be able to offload but we need a person not a computer to sit in front and, and talk because we can't see their emotions we can't we, we can't share the feelings and now hope everything goes okay and the slowly of the lifting of the lockdown will allow these young people to come back but you've got to also remember that some of these people have been in there where the parents have lost their jobs there is no financial sustainability they've gone on to universal credits you know that's had a massive impact you know, being not able to buy things for the children, parents having their own issues, and you've got children having their own issues. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And people like yourself, Luke, and, you know, organisations like yourself, Give Bradford, need to invest in these areas. And can I just say that, I know I'm going on a lot about the BAME community, but we are sidelined a lot of times, and we have got glass ceilings for careers. We've got unconscious biases going on we've got racism we don't have the you know we're discriminated maybe for wearing a scarf or something like that you know there's very sort of institutional racism that you know certain areas and certain jobs are difficult to get into so we need to be able to work with the employers as well as the the community as well and this bridging needs to be done and i've been in the community for the last 35 years we've improved but not enough yeah, and that, that bridging, as you describe it now, is that needs funding? That bridge, it could be a, a, a big bridge, it could be a small bridge, but that is the funding that will that joins everything together. Yeah, Absolutely, and I think um, what you were saying about mental health, um, really, really important, and we need to make sure that funding is given in a way that recognises yeah. almost all the work organisations like you do supports people's yes. mental health. Yes. Employment projects support people's mental yes. health. You know, projects that are about keeping people safe, support their mental health. Um, it's all connected. And I think too often funding looks at one specific issue and doesn't look at people as we all are, whole people that, you know, might need help with different things at different times. So um, really, really conscious of that, Naz, and hoping that we can, we can support around making the case for funding to, to be more like that and more reflective of what you need. Naz, just before you go... You've been doing some fantastic work um, <laughs> outside of the Magic Walton Home Fund work as well. Um, I know supporting um, a set of GPs to set up the UK's first women's only vaccine clinic. And I can't let you go without asking about that because <laughs> that's really exciting. Yeah, um, but it just sort of came about again. You know, we're a grassroots organisation, needs driven. It was a need and it needed to be addressed. And again, we come back to we fill the gap. So it was about bridging the gap. And also what for me is that um, a lot of marginalised, disadvantaged women, also the cultural and the tradition and, and the fear mongering that's been going on prevents people from coming forward. So we are a trusted organisation. So if I'm, I mean, I'm sure you've seen me getting my vaccine done in front of people 
So that was to raise awareness of how important it is to be vaccinated. If somebody trust me and trust the organisation and please come and get yourself vaccinated. Because again, these are women who are carers, who are uh, have got underlying health issues. But because of what happened with the social media and, and it was that, that fear that was put into people, that don't go, they're going to be injecting you with this and this and this. So it was these mixed messages that people were getting and very negative messages were preventing people from coming forward. And also this clinic that we set up was allowing women to have their privacy as well. So if they needed to talk about anything, um, if there was any issues, any crises, or if there was any interventions that we were able to help them with, we were open for a conversation. Brilliant, thank you. Um, just another example of how Bradford District's been on the map around COVID-19 response over this last year. And thank, thank you for sharing that. And that was really, really thank inspiring. You. Um, Naz Kazmi from Keithley Association for Women and Children's Centre, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Can I just say my last words to Luke? You know, there's always a, a beautiful saying in, in my, is that sadgai jariya, meaning that after a person has left the world and they leave something behind, a legacy. And can I say thank you very much and God bless your mother's soul and bless all you guys for doing such a wonderful job. And you know what? It's very heartwarming and um, I don't have the words to thank you enough and your family. Thank you very Honestly, much. Honestly, no, uh, thank you for doing the work that you're doing. You know, I'm just glad that we can facilitate it in some way because um, you're doing brilliant things um, and it's just you. been so great to, to hear it now. It's thank been you. really, really moving. Thank you. Wow. What fantastic, inspirational people. And I know that's the first time you've had chance to really learn about those projects in action, Luke. What do you think? Yeah, Steph, I mean, it, it was genuinely just so moving to hear the amazing work that they're doing. It is just genuinely, I just love sitting and, and just listening to it because it, it's just, yeah, it's amazing. And I think it's overlooked sometimes the amazing work that a lot of these grassroots projects do. Um, and yeah, I think there's one thing reading and, and researching these projects when you're thinking of funding them and another thing actually speaking to the people involved. So yeah, I know uh, I, I've nearly had a tear up of the second interview we just did. Um, just, yeah, genuinely, just both incredible people. I'm so glad that uh, I got to converse with them. I hope, I, you know, I get to meet them in person um, in, in more normal times because um, it would be, it would be amazing to do that. Um, and I know something that sort of touched on a bit earlier and we've touched on a little bit with the, the, the funding aspects and the longevity of the fund. Um, you know, we want, we want to keep doing this for, 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 well, for as long as I'm here, um, that's, that's, that's what we, we want to do. Um, and I think, I think facilitating, we just want to facilitate these grassroots projects because that's, that's where the work's done. That's where real change happens. Um, there are so many huge charities, uh, conglomerates and, you know, it's great to, to obviously give money to them, but sometimes me personally, I worry, um, if real change does does happen or if it's too slow whereas here you know as i say we just want to we want to find these 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 amazing projects dotted around and, and just be able to, to to help them help people um you know as i say facilitating um these grassroots charities these grassroots projects and i hope we can do that for for a long time moving forward yeah Great. We, we hope so too. And um, it's been brilliant to be able to facilitate that connection between you and your family and, and the projects. Um, and, and that's what we're here to do at Give Bradford. A lot of those organisations would find it very difficult to access funding without, without us in the middle. So um, thank you. And thank you for having the, the faith and the trust, Luke, to, um, to partner with us on that. That's it for our second episode. Thank you for listening. And a special thanks to Luke, Mary and Naz for joining us today. We hope this episode has inspired you to get in touch, find out more about our work in Bradford and how you can make an impact in the communities that need it most. If you enjoyed this episode, take a couple of seconds to rate it on your favourite podcast platform. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter and subscribe to our newsletter. And you can visit our website at givebradford.org.uk. Feel free to email us at givebradford at leadcf.org.uk. Speak to you soon for the next episode of Give Love Bradford.